first matter that's come before the court this morning is State of Ohio versus Quinones. Uh, as you know, each party will have 15 minutes to present oral argument. The appellant will proceed first and may reserve up to five minutes um, for the public. Uh, we've read the brief, so if you'll come up to this uh, podium closest to us, just introduce yourself and let me know how much time if any you'd like to present. Sure. sure. I, uh, Attorney Giovanna Scalata Bremke, I do uh, reserve three minutes. All right. Um, to simplify the facts in this case, because I know you read the brief, but um, essentially there was a controlled uh, delivery of a package large amount of cocaine. Uh, Ms. Canones uh, received that package at her sister's house in the rain um, and drove away, uh, was subsequently charged with trafficking and also possession and uh, major uh, drug offender specifications. Um, the principal argument in the first assignment of error is uh, essentially is a bench trial. So the uh, jury trial waiver um, didn't su substantially comply with the language as provided in the statute 2945.05. Uh, basically, that statute it gives the five requirements. It's in writing, signed by the defendant, uh, filed in the case, made a part of um, the record, and also made an open court. Uh, we're not disputing that those five were established. It's um, sort of a sixth requirement that the um, that it, the language follow the language provided in the statute, um, which courts have construed um, substantially that it must substantially comply. Um, so that language is uh, I, the defendant's name, defendant in the above case, hereby voluntarily waive and relinquish my right to a trial by jury, and I'd like to be tried uh, by a judge of the court in which the said cause may be pending. Fully understand uh, the laws of the state and that I have a constitutional right to a trial by jury. Um, the waiver in this case is uh, significantly different. Um, and I outlined five ways that it's significantly different in my brief. Um, the waiver in this case said the defendant waives her constitutional right to a jury trial and consents to this matter being tried to this one judge court. Furthermore, the defendant acknowledges that a jury trial. Uh, at a jury trial, the defendant would have the right to participate in the selection of 12 jurors, to exclude prospective jurors with or without cause, and to a unanimous verdict. So um, note in respect that the last uh, couple of lines, it actually includes more information regarding the rights that are waived than the statutory language. It, it does include different language. It sort of includes what, the, uh, what a jury trial would look like. Uh, as opposed to, um, you know, sort of what uh, the argument is that it doesn't, um, first of all, it's not written in first person. So the suggested language says, I, the defendant, um, and it's sort of as if the defendant was writing it. This waiver is more of a court order um, where it's saying the defendant uh, waives her right, as opposed to, um, you know, the defendant. Uh, you know, signing her own waiver. Um, so that's the significant difference is that uh, the, the, but this court in Woodbridge just almost last year, 2014, now um, I guess two years ago, held that the uh, waiver was, was faulty because it, it wasn't an understanding of that constitutional right. And I think that that's the key here is there wasn't in, um, there wasn't an acknowledgement of an understanding it was more of an order that that Ms. Cronona signed, as opposed to um, an understanding by her of those rights. Um, so essentially, that last sentence does outline what a jury trial would look like, uh, but it doesn't. Um, it, it leaves out some key things, and, and also that understanding of the constitutional right to the jury trial. Is the requirement that the waiver be in writing mean that it can't be? But this seems to be is a written memorialization of what happened in the trial court, and then the defendant acknowledges that writing by signing it. It does, but if a written waiver is required, are you saying that this written memorialization that's signed by the defendant is not sufficient because it doesn't say I? Right. 
um, I guess the even though there was that colloquy in the court, um, the uh, well, first of all, the, in Woodbridge, it's, um, there was a holding that the colloquy doesn't make up for that faulty waiver. And I guess the statute outlines it must be in writing and also in open court. So uh, to me, that's significant because they're, um, even though it is in writing, it also has to be in court and they don't make up for each other. It has to be, um, there has to be a good waiver and also a good uh, colloquy in court. So just because there was that colloquy and it was pretty lengthy colloquy in the um, transcripts, um, that doesn't make up for the fact that the waiver um, isn't in, you know, it's, it's faulty in the fact that it's not, there's not that understanding in the written waiver. Um, and, you know, they're separate in those ways and, and the statute does outline, um, you know, those, it just make that distinction. Um, there, uh, there's also a second assignment of error, um, and essentially the, the argument there is that uh, the conviction is against manifest way to the evidence. Um, the main piece of evidence, obviously, is the box of cocaine. Um, without that, you know, I wouldn't be here. So um, there was two different testimonies that there was 500 grams, 600 grams, and there was a break in the chain of custody three different times. Um, when it was opened in Puerto Rico, uh, the, that inspector didn't come here and testify. Uh, and the second, when it was mailed here, there was no GPS or uh, a tracking number, but it didn't necessarily um, track it where it went. Uh, so Is there testimony as to how it um, got to the United States? In other words, uh, did the state call upon an um, officer to testify as to what happened? in uh, Puerto Rico and then it was mailed to the offices here? Correct. There was uh, that testimony that was mailed here, um, but that time period between the time it left the Puerto Rico inspector and the time here, there's no obviously no testimony because it was just, uh, it's my understanding, it was just put in the general mail. Um, so uh, if we were to accept your uh, proposition of law, in every criminal case where um, that involves uh, drugs or money being sent from another jurisdiction, uh, would we be required to, or would we be saying that the uh, state would bear the burden of having an officer travel with the evidence in hand from point A to point B in every case? Well, I don't think so because the they did put a GPS monitor once it got to Cleveland. They put a GPS monitor in the box, um, so that then they could show where it went once it was delivered and then once it was accepted. Um, they didn't do that when it went from Puerto Rico to Cleveland. So if there was a GPS monitor, um, they had that capacity to do that to put the GPS monitor in there and show um, at least something of where it had been or. You you know, who knows who it was with during that time, if it was open. Um, there's no photos once it gets to Cleveland, uh, so there's really no um, proof that it was the same as what it was when it left Puerto Rico. Um, they, they had the capacity to do the GPS and they, um, you know, or track it somehow, not necessarily an officer, but something that um, in that in-between time, um, because it is a significant travel from Puerto Rico to um, Cleveland. So uh, the, 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 three, the three breaks in the custody were one of those um, Puerto Rico inspectors didn't testify, the mailing from Puerto Rico to Cleveland, and also when it was open in Cleveland, it was open two separate times, and neither of those times it was photographed. Uh, so essentially there's no link to how it was when it was in Puerto Rico and how it was in, when it was in Cleveland. So you say it was not photographed, but there was testimony about each opening once it got to the there was testimony about the opening, um, but there's no, uh, you know, during that, there was no sort of photos or no, it, they had the same content, except for the fact that there was 100 grams that were, you know, that describes in the, the testimony. Um, but there was no, um, essentially the other contents, the oatmeal, things like that that were in there. Um, those were all present. Um, but maybe not necessarily in the same order, uh, the same amount, things like that. 
I'd like to reserve the rest of my time. Uh -huh. about five minutes. May it please the court, my name is Natasha Guerrero, and I represent the appellee of the state of Ohio in this matter. Um, with regard to the first assignment of error in the actual waiver itself, the main case on point here would be the Woodbridge case um, decided by this district two years ago. Um, and in that matter, um, this court found that the juror waiver itself was um, insufficient. Um, and the main point in, in that, in which it was deficient, was that the waiver itself did not contain any sort of reference to the fact that the defendant understood that it was a constitutional right that um, uh, of a jury trial that he was waiving in that matter. Um, here the state would submit that that particular hurdle was in fact um, overcome here. We wouldn't we acknowledge that the language of the waiver in this matter is not the same language as contained within the statute. Um, but the main difference between Woodbridge and this particular matter is in fact the reference to the fact that um, she was waiving her constitutional right to a trial by jury, which was contained within um, the waiver that she signed um, before the court and um, also acknowledged in the colloquy with the trial court. Um, therefore, the state would submit that that jury waiver was in fact um, allowed the trial court to conduct a bench trial. Um, in this matter. With regard to the manifest weight arguments um, and the chain of custody, the, first the state would suggest or submit or argue here that um, Ms. Communis actually waived any sort of argument with regard to the chain of custody because she did not raise that argument in the trial court. Um, and even just in looking at that particular argument based upon the case law, is, and the facts of this case is that there were photographs in Puerto Rico when they first obtained the search warrant to open the package. They photographed the contents of the package itself, um, and those photographs were submitted to the trial court during the during the um, trial. The inspector here, Inspector Green, obtained a second search warrant once it uh, made its way to Cleveland. He obtained a search warrant to open the package, and he testified he did open the package, and that the contents of the package um, were fair. The pictures from Puerto Rico fairly and accurately depicted the contents of the package that he received, um, including the tracking label, the number, and all of that on the package itself. Um, and then from there, it was a controlled delivery was made. Um, therefore, the state was able to show that here's what we had in Puerto Rico. Inspector Green said, hey, I received that package and it's the same contents that was in Puerto Rico. So there show, there, that showed there between the two that there was no tampering with regard to the package. And then it was after the control delivery took place that um, it was opened again and the contents of the package were opened. I'm just a little confused. I apologize. Back in, um, when the package was first uh, opened, was packaged up, were the contents photographed separately and then in the package before it was sealed? Or uh, was the picture just of the sealed package with its tracking number? My recollection is actually it was photographed as it was being opened and kind of, you know, during the process of. So it was, you know, the package itself, the opening of the package, the contents of the package. So you had kind of that progression of the closed package and, and going forward from there. So it was photographed at the time that the that the postal inspector in the U.S. opened it. In Puerto Rico. I'm sorry. Did I? You, I apologize. You <laughs> with me with that one. Yeah. I apologize. It was in, in Puerto, Puerto Rico. Rico it correct, was Fully photographed. Correct, Your Honor. Initially. Yes. And yes, then Your Honor. Sealed and then the tracking number. Correct. Tracked through. Correct, Your Honor. Your Honor, I apologize. In That's Puerto Rico okay. was when the, all the photographing took place, okay. and then Inspector Green here received those photographs, reviewed them, he also opened the package and testified that it was consistent with what he received. How did the state uh, address uh, the difference of 100 grams 
uh, from the weight in Puerto Rico to the weight in um, the United States. That would, if I were the defendant, that would give me some pause. Um, I I know that there was there was testimony from each of the individuals, well, several of the individuals as well as the actual lab itself, and I don't know that it was necessarily. Um, testimony as to why there was a difference there or what the exact difference was. Um, but well, one said it was 500 grams uh, in Puerto Rico by the time it got to the United States. It was weighed by, was it BCI? Uh, yes, I believe it was sent to BCI and BCI. And it was 600 grams. So that uh, is a very um, interesting and potentially compelling argument uh, on behalf of the appellant that something was amiss in the chain of custody. In the chain of custody itself. Um, it, and, it, and actually, it, I believe with regard to that particular argument, um, Ms. Quinones was making um, with regard to that is that, and the state would submit that in order to have just the charges that she had, there was, um, at least if nothing else, if you look at it from the light most favorable to Ms. Quinones, that from the beginning there was at least 500 grams, which well exceeds um, what the statute requires here with regard to first degree felonies and major drug offender specifications. So even in looking at that um, particular aspect of it, from the very beginning, they said it was at least 500, which is well above the 100 grams that's required. Um, for the charges that she was indicted for. Um, um, so based upon the arguments here today, the state would request that this uh, court overrule Ms. Quinones' assignments of error and uh, affirm the conviction and sentence issued by the trial court. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honors. You have five minutes. Uh, first address the manifest weight issue with the 100 grams that's missing. Even um, acknowledge the fact that 500 grams, 600 grams, either way is the major drug offender specification. Um, really it's it's more about the handling and the chain of custody and was it really 500 or 600? Um, it could have been 100, we don't know. Uh, it could have been 50 uh, because of the fact that there was that break in custody and grams is a significant amount. It could have even, um, we don't know because it could have been could have even been different. So to say that the 500 or 600 grams either way is the MDO specification, um, you know, it's uh, it's really more about the handle. To get back to the jury uh, trial waiver, um, the state has made the argument that there was a reference to the constitutional right. And I'll submit, it does say the word constitutional in the waiver, um, but the holding in Woodbridge, uh, to, to go back to that case, is that uh, the defendant didn't fully understand uh, that he had a constitutional right. Uh, it's not that there was a reference to the word constitutional, a reference to a constitutional right. It's that um, there was a understanding of <coughs> the constitutional right. So essentially, the argument is that um, there wasn't a full, and, and actually the Woodbridge case says that there has to be a full full understanding, and that the defendant didn't fully understand. Um, and the way this waiver is set up, to be more of a court order uh, rather than a first person uh, waiver, the written in first person with the defendant's name and that acknowledgement doesn't show that there's an understanding, although it does reference um, the word constitutional, references the rights um, that they constitute that, that are contained in the Constitution. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both for your presentations. The court will take the matter under advisement and will issue a written um, opinion, which will be sent to both uh, parties, and you may certainly check the Supreme Court website. <coughs> Thank you. Have a good day.